Welcome to another installment of the Torah Teachers Roundtable with your hosts, Yoel Halevi and Jeff Gilbert. You can reach us at for Yoel Halevi, Hebrew in Israel at gmail.com. And Jeff Gilbert, you can reach Jeff at talkingtorah.org. And as always, we look forward to hearing from you. Okay, Barakim Ben Ebrahim, everybody, we're so happy you're with us again this week. This is, this is honestly the final. Uh, uh, roundtable of the season, and uh, we'll actually start off with the next roundtable of the season at the same time, and uh, Yoel will explain how that goes in a minute, but we're so thankful you're with us again this week, and we're so thankful that you're putting up with all of our craziness for the internet. Um, we, we're going to be working on it uh, a lot more this week, and hopefully we'll have something going soon. Uh, anyhow, so Yoel, we're so happy you're with us again this week, and uh, also to throw out this one quick thing. Uh, uh, you guys thank uh, God through prayers for the guy who lets me use this at his house uh, while his mother is away. So this is wonderful. So anyhow, uh, shalom aleichem, everybody, and welcome, Yoel. How you doing? I'm I'm doing good. You know, uh, finally got my sukkah up. Um, I have friends visiting from abroad to, to celebrate sukkah here in the land, which is which is really great because. You know, I'm kind of an odd ball where I live, and actually anywhere I live, I'm a little, I'm a little odd for a lot of people. Well, welcome to no, the club. It's, it's, well, it's, it's a little, you know, I'm a Bible scholar, so my approach to religion is very, very different. I understand things differently, and see things differently, and analyze things differently than most people surround me. And it's very difficult for them to think outside of the box. I mean, I think a lot of people can relate to that. And uh, yeah, thinkers yeah. are always outsiders to everybody else. It seems like yeah. most people are just, um, you, you don't want to use the term sheeple, but they do seem to be blindly walking along in their own traditions without any real understanding it's, or faith in what they're doing. It's it's true. It's true. You know, it's and that, that you know that that's one of the problems I've always had, and I've also always also always had this issue of wanting to discover the truth about things. And I'm I'm studying. Uh, the concept of angels at the moment is part of the study I'm doing at the moment. There are a lot of interesting, a lot of interesting stuff that's come up, and you know, reading all these papers. And though you know, but a week and a half from now I'm supposed to restart school, so that's going to go I have to go on a back uh, burner for a while. But it's going to carry on a little bit, and I'm going to start putting stuff up very soon. You know, and another thing is I really, I actually really need your internet to be up because. You know, I need someone to help me out with my website. Yeah, I know, I know. Uh, you know, that's everyone's going to benefit from that because that the website's going to contain like the more serious articles with the more serious information, the more serious teachings. You know, not the YouTube stuff that I do, which is very general. This is going to be, you know, good camera work uh, with better preparation of things. A lot of the recordings I do for YouTube. Are you know very you know, we call it an introduction to the information? While well, these are going to be a lot more advanced, uh, yeah. it's going to host yeah. all Cliff the different recordings. Versus, ver- Cliff Notes version uh, versus uh, you know college level version. Exactly, and you know some of the stuff is going to be for everyone. Some of the stuff you're going to have to subscribe to this. It's not going to be that expensive. Don't worry. I have this thing that really what I'm charging for is just to make sure I can pay for keeping the website up and all that. Um, you know, but, uh, yeah, we need, we, we need Jeff to get his internet up so he can carry on doing the wonderful work. And, yeah, it's, it's also, I want to thank everyone for being so positive about, about the, the thing, the recording we did for, the, for Ha'azino. Uh, it, it took quite a bit of work to actually prepare that one because there's a lot of obscure language there. And even even one person who's uh, quite a frequent commentator on stuff that I do said, you know, I didn't understand everything, but we need to own this information. So I've yeah. listened to this several times. Yeah, that was really great to hear. I mean, it was very encouraging. It's a, it's work. I mean, poetry is fun to teach. We're going to have some poetry here as well with a lot of difficult language. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, and a lot of research has to be put into these things. So I appreciate it when people appreciate the amount of work that has to be put into, into the recordings. Uh, in any case, yeah, um, the whole thing about having two, two portions, uh, basically what happens is in the rabbinic calendar, um, the rabbinic calendar started the month two days before the actual sighting. So, for example, Monday, uh, which I think was the 6th, if I'm not mistaken, was Yom Kippur in based on the moon sighting, which moves, um, moves the, um, 
the first day of Sukkot to Saturday to Shabbat. And I think it says that's the 11th or something like that. And the, the problem that it creates is that this Shabbat, well, there's no, there's no actual reading of the weekly portion. And what happens is that during Sukkot, the Zvezot Beracha, which is what we're going to be talking about today, is moved to what's preferred to as Simchat Torah, celebration of the Torah. Yep, and that's day, where we right? finished at the eighth day, Shemini Atzeret. The problem with Shemini Atzeret, there was no, no one really too sure what to do with it. So in Babylon, they developed this tradition that that's when they finished the Torah. And then the land of Israel, they finished the Torah every three to three and a half years. So they didn't really always come out at the same time. Um, and there were, I think there's some testimonies that sometimes in Egypt there were two communities and each community had different practices. One had a Babylonian <laughs> practice, the other one had the Alexandrian practice. Which Sounds was like what we deal with every, today. Yeah, every three to three and a half years. Um, and the, um, what happened there was that every once in a while, Every every three years they'll three to three and a half, every three years they'll finish the Torah together. So they try to find a filler for Shmini Atzeret, which basically the eighth day of the gathering can because an Atzeret is a gathering. It's usually the gathering. For example, if you take the story of David and Doeg the Edomite, it says Vehu Atzul Rifne Adonai. So Atzul is the same root as Atzeret. It's to the Atzul. It's to be in one place. It basically seems to be mean to mean a gathering. So Shmini Atzeret is a of their gathering, like a grand finale of everything, which is quite reasonable. Sure, sure. And, um, the, you know, there's no temple, so what do you do? So they decided to, that's when we're going to read the Torah, that's when we're going to finish the Torah. So next week, Thursday is the Shemini Atzeret based on the rabbinic calendar. Shabbat is already Shabbat in the rabbinic calendar, and the new, on the moon setting calendar, it's the eighth day, it's actually Shemini Atzeret on, of, of, uh, <laughs> of Sukkot. But in the rabbinic cycle, on the Shemini Atzer, which is Thursday, you read Vezot HaBerecha, and then on Shabbat, you read Bereshit. So, you, you, you basically next week, you have, you're going to have two recordings. You basically, you're going to have Vezot HaBerecha and uh, Bereshit. Uh, so, that explains that. Um, so, Vezot HaBerecha, it's after, before, um, I think I explained this last year. I'm going to explain it again anyhow. Uh, Vezot HaBerecha, basically, it's very, very common that before a, a leader passes on, they give yeah. a grand speech, yeah. and this is this is the first one, and this is why it's so long, and they also usually provide a, a blessing. Now, it's not accurate that I say this is the first one, because, for example, Abraham um, passes on to Isaac, he blesses him, Isaac passes mm-hmm. on to mm-hmm. Jacob, mm-hmm. he blesses him, and then, you know, when Jacob speaks to the tribes, he blesses them and right. also gives them a song. So there's certain, there, there's a discussion about the certain parallels between Bezot Beracha and the, and the last chapter. Yeah, Noah did it too, chapter. by the way. Uh, no, um. Yeah, he said, uh, we, it ble- the blessings over Shem and that the other two would serve Shem and would, yeah, you know, so it's, it's kind of the same it's, thing. It's kind of, you know, I'm going to agree with that. It's, it's kind of the same thing. It's a, it's a very good observation. Thank you. Uh, you know, that's, that's a really good idea. It's something to look into. Um, and the, the thing is that, you see, so you have this grand, this, 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 let me borrow the same word, grand finale here before he passes away. And he blesses each one of the tribes. Now there's always this question, for example, how many tribes actually exist. So each, each blessing tries to make sure there are 12 tribes. There's always this issue of trying to keep 12 tribes, when really, when you look at it, historically speaking, there were 14 at one stage. Why 14? Because you have Levi and you have the two halves of Menashe. Right, right. But Menashe, basically, Menashe is, is, uh, is Joseph as two, so it's always 14. Right. So it's not really the two halves of Menashe. Here, they're, they're trying to still keep the, the 12, so, um, you know, there's a whole question here. For example, why doesn't Shimon have a blessing here? You know, yeah, there's a several then, rumors. You know that there, there's several yeah. several things going on here. But this there's always this issue of making sure it stays twelve. And this is refer- these are things which are topological numbers. These are numbers that have significance: three, seven, eight, sometimes uh, ten. Um, then you have twelve. You have forty. There, these these are numbers that have significant each cul- significance. Each culture has a slightly different significance to them, but the idea, the overall idea of having the numbers mean something um, and making sure that you use those numbers all the time. 
Sure. Um, sure. Is, is very, it was very, very important in ancient Egypt. You understand there's a lot of symbolism. People nowadays uh, underestimate the concept of symbolism. But there's a lot of things that they did in the ancient world that today we're going like, eh, whatever, shrug, shrug. But no, to them it was important. If we're trying to, for example, if we're trying to reestablish the Tanakh as a living, vibrant thing that we're trying to follow what the Tanakh is saying, we have to also understand that they were into symbolism. They were into customs. They were into uh, into uh, ceremonies. You know how long the ceremonies were is a question, but there was a lot of meaning in what people did. It wasn't just you know oh the Torah says to to blow the shofar. I'm just going to blow the shofar and whatever. Not trying to understand if there's a certain symbolism behind it. You know you yeah. know I have to say uh, when you look at this as a marriage. And there seems to be a lot of, you know, using the term symbolism um, about, you know, God's relationship with Israel is that of a father. And also you can see uh, references to it's that of a husband and a wife. And in a marriage, the wife, now, honestly, again, we're talking about a husband who's righteous and who's worth it. But uh, a wife is supposed to help that husband be who he can be as well. But beyond that, you know, the wife that doesn't do anything to uh, any ritual for a husband, any kind of recurring uh, acts of, of love for a husband, you know, there becomes a lot of staleness. It becomes very stagnant. It's not very alive. There's, it just seems to be your two people passing in the night almost. Uh, and I could see the reason why Israel proper has been focused on some of the traditions, because that's how you say things, I love you. You can see that in a, in a husband and a wife, and I really think that that's something that translates into our relationship with God. Yeah, exactly. In any case, so going back to the to the issue of these speeches, I mean, Mo, Jacob does it, he does it in the form of a song. Moses does it, and he does the form of a song. Joshua does something different. He gives basically a lecture, which is almost a, a shortened version of the book of Deuteronomy, but he puts down a threat, which is really unusual. He says, you know, as for me and my home, we will serve the Lord. You do you do whatever you want. I mean, he's a lot more militant, a lot more... Yeah. He, he's, he's not... He's not He's not his teacher. There's this saying, for example, that if Moses is a sun, jo- Joshua is a moon. He's only reflecting to some degree the amount of light that Moses was. And this is why for him to put down a threat, he does it more of an, almost on a personal level. Unlike Moses, that when he puts down the threat, he puts it down, this is a threat of God. This is not right, me right. wanting anything for myself. Joshua is, it becomes a little bit more personal when he says it. Yeah, I don't and care what Samuel, you guys do, but I'm going to serve God. <laughs> Exactly, and then and then Samuel um, does a very similar thing. He gives a, a speech before he dies, and he, it's a lot more personal. I mean, I would say personal, but he reminds me more of Moses. And you find that psalm that says um, it's one in, somewhere in the eighties or the nineties of the of the psalms, where it says it's somewhere in the nineties of the psalms, it says that uh, you know Moshe v'Aaron b'Chanav u'Shmuel b'Korei Shema, Moses and, and Samuel. Uh, Moses and, and Aaron with his priests and Samuel with those who call call to his name, and you can see that Moses and, and Moses and Samuel are positioned like not as equals, but they're connected in some way or another. Mm-hmm. Samuel was basically uh, when I when I did my recordings on uh, the book of uh, Samuel, when I um, I explained something that a rabbi that I studied the book of Samuel with many years ago said that Samuel is like a, a spark of light. After a very long time of darkness, like as if the time of the judges after Joshua died and the elders died was almost like an exile in Egypt. Yeah, well, another secondary Samuel was, exile. Samuel was was Deuteronomy eighteen. Well, one of Deuteronomy eighteen. Well, a, a prophet like I, me who come, who will be one of your yeah, brothers. I mean, you know, that that's also one of the things that, that I emphasize there that you have to understand that. The, f- the fact that it's in singular doesn't mean that it's a singular. It's one right. person. That's right. it. It's, exactly. That's a, that's, exactly. A, that's a misconception. If whatever what it happens, saying. he's going to send a <clears throat> Exactly. But Samuel is like a, a parallel of Moses, and he brings down a law of sorts where he talks with them about the, the customs of the kings, and he judges, and he's a prophet. It's, 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 it's mm-hmm. a parallel there. Mm-hmm. But when he, when he carries on, he doesn't sing. He just take, gives a speech. And then David, before he dies, he gives a yep, speech. Yep, and, yep. and then we don't really hear much about that. It, it kind of vanishes. We don't really have a record of it. But you see that it's a style. Every every leader is supposed to give uh, an account of 
what he's leaving to the people after he passes away. So that's that's really the whole book of Deuteronomy. And then he finishes with a song, which is basically a blessing to everyone, because before before a person dies, the last thing was do is you know say goodbye to the family and probably pray over them and hope that you know the prayer is is heard. So the the thing that we have here, there are a lot of interesting terms here, just in the beginning, the first couple of verses, uh, which are are kind of tricky to explain. And they spent probably an hour plus just over compiled books trying to understand the first half of the song. A lot of interesting things that came up. So um, the first verse is just an opening statement. It's not part of the blessing itself. So this is the blessing that Moses blessed. Moses, the man of Elohim. He's the Isha Elohim. It's very interesting that Moses is not, never, don't really find him being called um, um, Navi, the regular term that we find in the sure. Bible for a prophet. We find loads and loads of different terms. I mean, I just finished a book about the issue of prophecy, and there's a, there was a whole discussion there about the terminology about what prophets are. But the classic word is Navi. Some people think that it's related to a root that means to call, so he's a caller. Uh, like, for example, Kerabi Garon Ve'al Tachsoch. There's a verse, I think, uh, in, I think it's in, in Isaiah. Um, I think it's maybe Isaiah 11, maybe. I don't remember exactly. And the here is referred to as Isha Elohim, the man of God, which is an interesting uh, term. And I think uh, Joshua is also referred to as Isha Elohim. Um, and what is this? Con- what is this connection between these two words, Isha Elohim, the man of God? I mean, what does it mean, a holy man? What, is it, what exactly is this term? Could it be synonymous think, with the idea of son of God? I mean, because Solomon was called the son of God. N- well, no, because um, son of God is, is a much more complex issue to go into. Uh, it connects also to the question of uh, Bar Alahin used in Daniel. Is this another, you know, Bnei Elim? Um, all these different no, terms. No, I mean just somebody that God views as a son. You know, the, the, calling him uh, the man of God would be just kind so, of a, a, a similar term to the idea of him being, you know, he's my kid. You know, this is somebody I, I consider my own. So here, actually, I think that this is a construction that has a possessive meaning. Okay. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a, it's not um, demonstrative or it's, or it's not uh, adjectival in the sense of oh. uh, attributive. I, th- I think this is more of a possessive attributive. This is a, it may, have been, it, may have been, it may have been a new term, but I think, I think there's a term called ad, 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 possessive adjectival. That it's functioning as an adjective in, in the construction, but it's possessive. It means he is a man that was chosen by God. He's okay. not just okay. a man of God. Oh, this is a man of God. He's a holy man. No, this is a man who was chosen by God. Sure, sure. He is, he is function in the world. Okay, cool. So, you know, his function in the world is to be uh, the messenger of God. He is chosen by God and so on. So, by the way, as you know, not too many people receive that title. Amen. Uh, there there are several cute. titles. There's, uh, there's Eved Adonai, which is the servant of the Lord. And there's also Isha Elohim, which is the man of God. And these are both people who are chosen by God. Um, and Moses, actually, by the way, named both by both of them. Because, for example, when uh, in the beginning of the book of Joshua, it says, Moshe Avdimit, Moses, my servant, has died. You know, but it was very important there, by the way, just to, to, to make the point that Moses is dead. This is this is another thing, and this is something we have to bring up at the end. But there's there's a, a the, the text takes a long while. It's usually the text tries to cut back as much as it can. Here it takes its time, emphasizing Moses is dead. And there's there's an interesting inscription that was discovered, which is the Stella of um, of Misha, King of Moab, where he mentions that he took. The vessels of the temple of God, and he uses Yud Hey Vav Hey there mm-hmm, in the mm-hmm. Stella, and it raises a question: Why was there a temple to the God of Israel on Mount Nebo or Nebo? And there is this suspicion here that after Moses died, some people wanted to create a worship of the character of Moses. And this is why the the, the copper snake or the bronze snake sure, survived sure. because it was something that Moses made. A thousand years. And there was yeah. A, yeah, and there was a lot of this thing there were that there was this movement to try to worship Moses as a as a person and then you know, idolize him, uh maybe not as a god, but to erect a shrine in his in his uh in his name and so on. 
and the the Tanakh was uh, the Torah was basically trying to say, listen, he's dead. He was this human. Forget about it. And 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 that's very very important to us even to today because, yeah. for example, saint worshiping is very very problematic. Um, you also have uh, people who celebrate rabbis who passed away. I have issue with that. It's very, very questionable, a lot of these practices. Um, and it makes the point. Moses is dead, and that's it. And the, you carry on. The next generation, the next leader comes up, and that's it. That, that's how it's supposed to work. Don't dwell on the person. Dwell on the message. Right, right. Well, one of the things you mentioned earlier, I wanted to just make sure we pointed out, is that he's called uh, Isha uh, Elohim. So ha Elohim. Isha ah Elohim. The 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 title is very seldom given. Today everybody wants to be the man or the woman of God. And everybody has their own sign, everybody has their own miracle, everybody has their own vision, everybody has their own dream, and everybody wants to have this title. They think it's something that everybody had and it was a common title. It wasn't a common title. You know, Moses was one out of millions. You know, his elders were what, seventy some odd out of millions. Uh, you know, Joshua was one out of millions. There were not, it wasn't a common thing for someone to be the man of God. So people need to relax. Enjoy the life yeah. that God gave you. It, you don't have to be more than you are. Well, that's the thing. I mean, we, we, we live in a world where everyone tries to be special. And I, I go around saying, you're not that special. Yeah, right. Okay. I, 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 it's mean to say it, but I think that the, the, Western, the Western mindset that I see with a lot of people about being special, yes, you are special. You're a person. Yeah, hallelujah. You're you're a person. You're you're a human being. That's enough. That makes you that's that makes you special. But everyone today wants to feel as if they they have a personal relationship with God. Mm -hmm. And some and that people God even answers go, their prayers immediately, and God always responds when they call. And and you know, it doesn't work like that. I mean, they have to be very very blunt about it. It doesn't work like that. It's as mean as it may sound, um, you know, on a national level, we have a relationship with God. On a personal level, I don't too sure exactly how it works. You know, it's, There's it's, not it's a not lot of detail. Think. I mean, David had a relationship with God, but still, it David wasn't was something that God spoke to them every day. Yeah, exactly. I mean, people think that you know, there were people walking around with God echoing in their ears all day and believe me first of all you do not want that right it would, as a human being it would probably drive you crazy I mean it would literally make you go insane because it's something the, the sheer awesomeness of, of such a thing it, it would just completely blow up your uh, blow your mind up you know it's, it's, it's not it's not something you can deal with all the time and the other well, side yeah, of it the, as look well look in the garden is, real quick look in the garden you know Adam walked with God in the cool of the day the rest of the time, Adam was on his own. Uh, you know, exactly. Possibly. No, I, mean, I think I think exactly. I think you're 100 percent right on that one. You know, it's it's not. It's it's people have a lot of misconceptions about who God is, and everyone's trying to say what God thinks, and everyone's trying to explain, you know, the nature of God. And there's a, in Judaism, for example, we say it's a lot of stuff we don't know. And you know what? We're fine with that. Yeah, and that's okay. Absolutely. We, you don't have to have an answer for everything. Your faith does not have to be tied to evolution or, or creation or, or your faith doesn't have to be tied to anything. It's, you have faith that God said this and you trust him. It's just trust. Exactly. Exactly. It's, it's really, it's really if, it, if it was that easy, then where, where would the challenge be? Right. To be a man of God, if it was that easy, if it was a dime a dozen then how would God's word ever be heard? It'd, it'd, it'd be common. Exactly. And if there, it, 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 it's, there's a lot of growing up that has to be done in faith. That's part of it. And, and the problem is that as it goes, and if you look at the Tanakh history, it repeats itself. We never learned, we never learned the lesson, you know, and I, oh, yeah. there are arguments, there are arguments, for example, at the moment about the price of living in Israel. And I responded and basically said, listen, if you can't afford all this junk you're buying, then don't buy it. Yeah, right. You have to have a certain you have to have a certain level of financial wits in these things. You know, I grew up poor. I did not have I any book that I could put my hands on. I cherished any any article of clothing that belonged to me. I kept 
any anything that was mine, I made sure that I kept it in a good condition, usable condition. Oh, yeah. And used it until you couldn't repair it anymore. I mean, you didn't just exa- throw it away because it had a stain on it. Exactly, and it and it's. Um, I live that way now. Know, <laughs> No, but, but that's the thing. So I developed a certain level of financial wit. The same thing here, you know, to think that God marches to your to your drum. Yeah. I mean, seriously, how many how many gods do you think there are out there? Yeah. I mean, you basically what you want is an own, your own your own personalized God. Where's the where's the education in that? He made us in his image. We have to strive to be like him, to be responsible. Well, keep in mind, I mean this to is this is all growing in our in our generation from the bumper stickers, you know, God is my co pilot and all this other stuff. And then the Baptists, they had their big thing that God is not my co pilot, God's my pilot and I'm the co pilot and the old blah 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 blah. Where in reality you're the pilot, you know, you choose your co pilot and you travel through your life with the directions that he gave you. And he blesses you when you obey that. You don't need to hear from him every day. He told you what you do to be blessed. Exactly. Exactly. So, if the, and, and this is the thing. This is also what Moses is trying to do here in the blessing. He's basically saying, each one of you is now an individual. You're going into the land and you have to make a lot of decisions by yourself. And I, the only thing I can do from this point on is give you a blessing that... You'll be blessed, and you'll survive. And I'm, bring, I'm saying that deliberately because you're about to hear something that I think a lot of people don't notice. And you know, I have to go. I have to. I have to go as the way of the land. And I'm leaving you to to your to your own devices yeah, and, and your own stiff neck devices. And and I hope and pray that it will work. They go and and that's the thing. So. First of all, the first the the, the 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 first verse in this uh, description, and we won't be able to cover everything. I want to no, cover no. The, the tricky parts here, but you know it says that the Lord came from Sinai and glowed from Seir, Lamo, which is a Lamo means for himself, but it doesn't fit the description here. So some people think that this is a is a dithographia here. I can't remember what the term is in English, but we're missing a consonant, so it's really Lamo. He appeared from Seir for his people. Yeah. He appeared from the mountain of Paran and came, that's an Aramaic word, by the way, it's kind of unusual, but in, not, in poetry it's not unusual, it's true like that. Mirvivot Kodesh, from the thousands of Kodesh. And some people want to th- say that Mirvivot uh, Kodesh is uh, uh, the, these, the angelic hosts, but the Book of Deuteronomy doesn't really talk a lot about the issue of angels so I I'm going to let remember, that one go I can't remember a verse that talks about angels at all not, in, in not Deuteronomy in, in Deuteronomy no and I'm, that's part of the research I'm doing now the the silencing of angels in the uh, in in certain texts it's a, very, it's a fascinating topic because it was probably trying to battle the idea especially book of Deuteronomy it's trying to battle the idea of any other powers in the world even if it's an angel if we take angel in the way we we perceive angels nowadays, um, that these these are beings of God and they do God's bidding. Back then, some people confused angels with gods, and that's also. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm basically what what I'm doing now is I'm tr- I'm tracking back the earliest um, cases where we see something that can be identified as angelic hosts. And then build up from that. This is a very, very important field in uh, biblical studies, and I have I have uh, some really interesting material about this. We'll get to it. Maybe we'll also do a special <laughs> about that yeah, one as yeah, well. We'll put it on the list. Yeah, put it on the on the whiteboard. Um, but anyhow, there, I read this theory that claims that what it seems to be this is the uh, appearance of God on Mount Sinai, and the commentator I was reading about this basically said it's interesting. The term Seir, for example, uh, reminds people of Mount Seir, which is Edom, but we find the term Seir mentioned in other places as well. All and, and these are these are completely different areas. So what they theorized here is that Sinai and Seir and Paran and Kodesh are all the same place. Kind which of, was kind of a supp- synonyms for Sinai? Exactly. Exactly. Uh, and this is why, what is Revivot Kodesh? That raises the whole question. What is this? The thousands. Is Ravav here? Um, um, well, wouldn't that, thousands, could, or is it something else? Couldn't that be a picture of 
of the day when the when Israel was Kodesh for one day Israel was Kodesh and he and he if we're talking about Mount Sinai then couldn't this be referring to the day of the covenant the thousands who stood in front of Kodesh yeah. in front of the mountain well the thing is that the term Kodesh as well is a term that we find other places as names of for example there's a claim Manuel Velikovsky claimed back in the 60s that Kodesh was another name for Jerusalem and for example in Arabic Jerusalem is called Al-Quds which is Kodesh so mm-hmm. Kodesh was a name they used for places which were considered to be holy because the word Kadosh is this exact same word uh, then we have Mimino and then we have this we, this case of Kriyanktiv so for those who don't remember what Kriyanktiv is uh, it's a situation when we write something in a text, but we read it differently. And it, the word itself can be read as ashedot, which are um, the base of uh, mountains, like the, basically the slopes of a mountain. But in the in the in the in the Masoretic text, it's broken down to esh dat, fire of dat. Dat is a Persian word, which is datu, which means religion. Or as you know, sorry, in modern no, Hebrew, it means something. religion. In pun. Uh, knowing or knowledge or something? Uh, no, it's uh, law. Oh, okay, okay. And if you go to the book of Esther, it says dat, kedat hamelech, and that's the, the law of the king. So that's probably an incorrect breakdown. It really should be left as one word, and ashedot would be fitting something that describes uh, a mountain, but however, lamo again, this term lamo appears here. So this is actually considered to be a difficult verse, which we do not have a clear uh, explanation of what the verse is actually saying. God appears in this whole bunch of mountains. Maybe it's all the same mountain. Something about slopes, maybe, and something to maybe to his people. He on the slopes to his people, which Not again could clear. be referring to the day of the covenant. Exactly, because no, he, cause it, he it spoke, seemed, and they said, and, and it seems to be that they, they, they s- felt his presence through the mountain. Yeah, I mean, I can accept that. It seems to be that he's talking about the first appearance of God, the actual appearance of God before people, for the people, but. You know, he was shrouded in the cloud, um, you know, so they didn't really see him. They only saw a fire, and maybe they saw the fire glowing through the cloud. Uh, it's another interesting subject by itself. And then verse 3 says, Af choveh amim kol kedoshav beyadecha. So if you can give me an English translation of verse 3. Sure. I want though, to hear he has, though he has affection for the peoples, all his holy ones are in his hand, are in your hand. They place themselves at your feet, bearing your words. So again, kol kedoshav beyadecha. Some people argue this is Israel. Some people say these are angels. Uh, there, there is this term kedoshim um, that refers to angels or the divine consul in some places. But this again, this is a bit of a tricky verse. So he, it seems to be that he loves his people. Um, and all his chosen ones or his holy ones are in his hand could be kind of like protection to some 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 degree. But it could also and be referring to it, if verse two is talking about this being the day of the covenant, then then verse three is basically the same would be in the same context, I would assume, and that kind of makes sense to me. Uh, it, no, it makes sense. I mean, it may, uh, maybe we should work with that line. I think I think it's a really really good line here. So vehem tuku tuku is it seems to be that they are they surrender so they bow down to some mm-hmm, degree mm-hmm, they submitted they, mm-hmm. they submitted before his feet but what is yisamid barotecha they'll be carried in your uh, um amida barotecha sorry that's very similar and and Yisam they are placed in your hand I mean isn't there a place in Isaiah that they uh, that Israel is inscribed upon the hand of God yeah yeah al yadayim chakotich yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so here, Yisami Dabrotecha, this kind of seems to be a very clear reference to the commandments, the Dibrot. Midabrotecha, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so it seems to be this is the Ten Commandments. And then he says in verse 4, he says, Torah Tzivalanu Moshe Morasha Kielat Yaakov. Right, that's a, one of the first verses you learn as a child, if you're Jewish. Uh, a Torah Moses commanded to us, an inheritance to the, to the congregation of Jacob. Mm. That's actually the translation of it. Yeah, actually, uh, Shokin a ch- has a bit different, but I like the inheritance. I like instead of possession, I like inheritance. So Morasha uh, can, is from the root Yarash, which is the inheritance, because uh, a possession would be achaz and achuza, and that's a little different. This is an inheritance. This is something you pass on to your children. A possession is something that can be taken away from you at one point. This is this is an inheritance. You own this. This belongs to you. Sure, it's tied to the land, which is also the inheritance. 
and Kihilat Yaakov, right? the term Kihilat is very rare. It from, comes from the word Kahal, uh, but Kihila in modern Hebrew means a community. Kihilat Yaakov seems to be the, the assembly of Jacob. So it's actually the word Kahal, which is an assembly. Kihilat Yaakov is the assembly of Jacob, which again seems to be like the assembly before the mountain. Right, right, right. Because there were there there is there is at least through some theory, there were those of Israel who did not leave Egypt and others who did not go with Israel when they left Egypt. So those who did, the remnant, however many that was, the assembly, uh, are the ones that received the commandments, and it was a possession or an inheritance for them. And then you have verse five continues this idea of Vahivi Shuun Melech. So um Give me a translation of verse 4 for a second. I want to hear what the English says about this one. Verse 4 or verse 5? Uh, verse 5, sorry. Okay. Five. Now he became king in Yeshurun, which is an interesting choice of the word. Uh, we spoke about that last week as well. Mm-hmm. When there gathered the heads of the people, together the tribes of Israel. So Yeshua and Israel are synonymous parallels here, very clearly. Yeshua also we mentioned is a, is a poetic uh, reference to Israel. And there was a king in Yeshua, and basically God became king over Israel. Mm -hmm. And this really follows the idea that God God is your king, and wherever a human being is sent to to, to rule you is uh, an equal amongst equals. If you've ever heard that term, the king of Israel is really an equal amongst equals. He is not really above anyone. God is your king. Amen. But God is the only one who is really which above is, you. Which is why, which is why Samuel, whenever he spoke with God about Saul, and he said, "Don't worry, Samuel. They haven't rejected you. They've rejected me, because because God it, is the king." Exactly, because they said, "Make us, give us a king like of the rest of the nations that surround us." So, beat asef l'asheam, the gathering of the heads of the people. Now, l'asheam might be a reference, a bit of a, maybe. You know, I'm going to be careful with this one. Might be that Israel is the head of the nations. So this it doesn't refer to the head of heads of the nation, basically basically the elders or some of that. Though if you go to the story and if you go to the description in uh in uh Exodus it sounds as if the elders uh were assembled in a separate group and they were the ones who were nearest the mountain. They saw uh God and beneath yeah, they him was saw God uh, and Moses uh, talking. They were off eating at their banquet and they could see from a distance. That 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 seems to be the case. It might be this, or you can argue that because the Shuon uh Am and Israel might be all three of them might be connect might be the same thing just repeated three times. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's possible. It's, I'm just throwing that as an extra option here. And then we have the question. So we 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 have the opening. He he for some reason mentions seems to be mentioning the the um the gathering of Israel at the foot of the mountain and receiving the covenant with God and you know I'm not too sure exactly what would be the 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 reason for them to be connected to one another, but what this is what he did here. But then there's a question here of <clears throat> excuse me, of the sequence of the names here. So he starts in the series first series is Reuven Yehuda, okay, Levi Binyamin, and then you have Yosef. Now the thing is that Yosef is a um Yosef is another head. But what's very interesting is the follow the following description here. We'll, we'll, I'll try to piece this all together and you get the idea. So it says, "Yichir Reuven va'alimot v'him metav mispar." May Reuven, Reuven, may Reuven live and not die, and his people will be will be many. And what kind of a blessing is that? He will it, it, die. It's, it's uh, Tom, his lineage. A, his lineage would would last. No. No. It, well, and yes. I mean, yes. That's that's correct, but. Blessing through a negative. <laughs> well, kind of, he, kind of, he seemed to do that kind of quite peculiar. a bit with some of those boys. Oh, you'll see the next one. And this is to Judah. Lord, hear the, the, the voice of Judah. And to his people you will bring him. His hands will be, I would say, maybe powerful or strong to him. Basically, they will have strength. And you will be a salvation uh, you will be a strength to his hands, and you will be a salvation from his enemies. Again, this sounds kind of sad, you know. Sounds like he's going to be fighting if, a lot. Yeah. So Reuben has to survive, and Judah is he has he has to be strong, he has to survive, and he has to have the ability to join his people. Kind of strange. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you got a lot of work ahead it's, of you, boy. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's kind of strange. But then Levi is celebrated. Levi had this long description. He's very celebrated. And he says to Levi, your tumim and urim, 
Um, actually, maybe you should translate it first. Read, read, read all four verses, okay. 8 to 11. Okay. To Levi, he said, your Tumen and your, thum- and your Urim, uh, for, your, for your loyal man, whom you tested at Massah, you quarreled with him by the waters of Merivah, who says of his father and of his mother, I have not seen them, his brother he does not recognize, and his children he does not acknowledge, for they have guarded your sayings, your covenant they have watched over. Let them instruct your regulations to Yaakov, your instruction to Israel, putting, putting smoking incense in your nostrils and complete offerings on your slaughter site. Bless, O Yehovah, his wherewithal and the works of his hands. Accept with favor, smash the loins of those rising up against him, those hating him from rising up. Yeah, Levites. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that God will fight for them. Yeah, tribal pride. Yeah. Um, but here, you know, suddenly the Levite is celebrated. He held the covenant. He protected the covenant. He's so blessed. He's so amazing. Same thing with Benjamin. You know, he's the friend of the Lord. He's he he dwells with protection. God dwells over him and protects him and everything. First, the thing with the fact that there's a structure of two and two. There are two who seem to be very pathetic and need a lot of help. And there are two who are being protected because they're so awesome. But it's odd that Benjamin receives such a harsh judgment uh, later on. Well, Benjamin, yeah, Benjamin goes for a very, very difficult, rough time. Yeah, he does. Uh, well, you know, you know how that, you know what happens. The, uh, the spoiled kids often get the hardest life. Yeah, but the thing, it's, it's actually a very important thing that you brought it up because this actually that proves that this um, this piece of poetry was written. Before, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, good point. What happened with the tribe of Benjamin? And a lot of scholars agree that the story about the tribe of Benjamin was actually in the early history of the Judges period, which means it moves around the 12th or 13th century BCE, which means this has to be dated to the 14th, 15th century BCE. Right. For those who don't realize, Benjamin, um, there was a bit of a problem uh, with a young lady in Benjamin, and uh, Benjamin did not do anything to help, and. As a result, at judgment, the rest of the tribes basically came in and, and disciplined Benjamin very harshly and spread them out throughout the tribes. So they ceased to be a tribe at some point. Exactly. So there's a bit of a dating game, dating in the sense of date, of timeline, that you can, you can kind of prove from some of this information. The songs are considered to be very uh, from different periods. I mean, I'm talking about high criticism here. It's something completely different. But uh, it's just an interesting point that came to me. But right, because some people, is, uh, just for those who don't realize, some people think that Deuteronomy was written in the Second Temple period, and this is an example no, that it was not. N- well, no, actually, the opposite. Oh, I, I thought the Deuteronomists. The, the, I thought the, the that classic, was part of this whole thing. The classic theory is that Deuteronomy was written in the First Temple period, based on an earlier manuscript. That, for example, Moshe Weinfeld says that okay. that. What, that the Deuteronomy as we have in front of us was written after the times of King Josiah based on a an earlier manuscript of something which was similar but a little different and the theory is that P or Priestly the, or PH Priestly and Holy which is the book of Leviticus was written in the, in the second temple period but that's really something Wilhausen invented because he had difficulty with the concept of organized religion and uh, Judaism being an organized religion and rituals and all that uh, it was more it was more personal and more his personal Preferences to things than the, than the, than the actual research and his theories are. I mean, we studied that, and I, I actually wrote out my own theory about it, and, and there was a lot. It was it was very interesting the interaction between my and, and my professor and I, but uh, it was very evident, and every, a lot a lot of scholars agree that Wilhausen's theory is a base to something, but again, he was driven by a lot of other things and yeah, another agenda, sure, sure. So there are, there are plenty of holes in Wilhausen's theory. I mean, it's it's one of the earlier theories, and they, there's a lot of discoveries. I mean, the, the foundation of, of the theory itself has been really uh, taken to bits. I mean, in any case, but I find it, I find it very very interesting that you know Judah Judah is always, was always kind of like a it's always Judah and Israel. Judah is always kind of like at the side. Reuven Reuven is kind of sad because Reuven lost his rights as a firstborn. He's placed as the first one. Because, you know, he is the firstborn, but he kind of lost it for, for, after doing something pretty stupid. And this is why he's more described in like a pathetic way. Sure, of, sure. Like J- Jacob kind of kind of told him off 
Moses is kind of continuing that kind of an idea. I think it, it might be a hint that the sons of Reuben, the Reubenites, were kind of like looked down by everyone. Sure. So Moses is saying, just help him survive. <laughs> Judah was very, very strong, but Judah had Judah had a problem that he 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 might have the tribe of Judah might have had a lot of difficulty with the other tribes, which is something that we can maybe even see today. Yeah. Uh, you know, so it's all in the family, and history repeats itself. Basically. Well, when you have a strong but, brother, if you've got a bunch of kids, and you've got a strong boy, and he kind of is the de facto you know bully for the house and he's the protector for the house and he's the you know so he gets the both sides of the coin he's the bully to his brothers but he's also their protector and that seems to be judah's lot in life here yeah i i, I tend to agree with that i mean judah judah had a very love-hate relationship with the rest of the tribes basically um that that's why i love that's why the tribes that didn't really have much difficulty to just join Ephraim, uh which is basically joseph because Joseph was recognized as one of the strongest tribes and one of the natural leaders, and this is why Joseph is highly celebrated here. Right, this Joseph also was going to have a lot more people in his in his lineage as well. Yeah, brother, there is this theory that says the Book of Deuteronomy was really kept and celebrated in the northern tribes. Uh, there's some elements that might prove that, but I, I I'm not too sure about any of it. But one thing that proves is this is this is when. This isn't a period where Joseph is still seen as the leader. If this book originated in King Josiah's period in Judah, Joseph would never be celebrated to that degree. Good point. And Judah would never would never be described as a weak person. Right, right. Um, it, it, you know, de- definitely to, so- the, uh, to the victor goes the uh, the ability to rewrite history. Exactly. So it's it doesn't none of that seems to be plausible. But Joseph, for example, is like thousands of blessings thrown on his head. You know, his land, you know, is blessed by the Lord and yeah. from the excellence gifts of, of the, the sun's heavens. produce, the excellence of the moon's crops. Yeah, yeah. Joseph is like putting a pedal still and danced around. Yeah, here. right. You know, he's blessed by the, the will of the one who dwells in the in, in the bush and so so many you know, he's the head of his people as verse verse sixteen. Ul nezir he is the he's the crown of all his brothers. It's the one way of translating or you know, looking at it. You know, Hadaglo is the he is the Bechol Shol, he's the firstborn, he's the ox, you know, and he has oh the horns of a unicorn. Oh yeah, yeah. I have wild ox here, but yeah, this is unicorn in some translations. I I, I actually posted about this. A re'em is a wild goat or a wild ox or an uh, an oyax or something. I'm not sure I can pronounce it. I put a post about it on my Facebook page. Uh, you know, I, I made me realize some people think it means a rhino, but rhinos are not common in the land of Israel. Uh, so no. Um, hippos used to exist here. It was referred to as behemoth, by the way. Oh yeah, the hippo. Uh, well, yeah, but you know, depending on how we read Job, the behemoth had a big tail. So I'm not sure hippo fills that, but I understand what you're saying. I don't know. We can look into the Job one day. Okay. Good. Um, but a re'em is a well-known animal. It is a wild ox or a wild goat. They have massive horns. Uh, there are different types of them. I actually chose to put in my Facebook post the the one with the curly horns. Uh, the uh, but there's ones. The, there's the ones with the long kodu horns as well, uh, but a re'em is a well-known animal, and he okay, he sure. rams his enemies, and they are the. Th- and by the way, revot and alafim here. Remember, some someone to say that you know the big horn, small horn, but Ephraim was smaller than Menashe. Menashe was the bigger tribe, but Menashe is described by its thousands. Well, Ephraim is described by his tens of thousands. So this is not the same as, for example, when David and, and Saul walked in and they gave David the tens of thousands. It was this is not a, mm. a precise numbering. This is more an issue right, of right, right. the tens and because he Joseph is blessed through his children. So it's just Ephraim and Menashe. Ephraim was greater than Menashe because Ephraim was a, was a lead was a tribe of leaders, and this is why he's celebrated by his tens of thousands. That's all. That's all. It's it's not it's sure. not that the numbers are really representative of what was really going on historically. Just really to to look at uh, 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 more more like you know there's millions of one and thousands of another. It's not meant to say that there literally are millions and literally thousands, but the size of one group is much bigger than the size of the other group. Yeah. And the and the other very interesting thing here as well is that you see that Reuben and Judah are kind of put aside 
They they have a they they have a different opening. All the rest of the tribes have, and to this he said, you know, the, uh, you know, amal, ulvinyamin amal, and ulyosef amal. They all get this amal form. Yeah, he said, yeah. And then and and then in verses six and seven, which is Reuben and Judah, they're like, oh, may Judah live. And to this yeah. is to Judah, and he said, it's like as if they're like been pushed aside. Maybe, You're going to stay in the naughty corner. Maybe, maybe Moses didn't want them to feel bad, so Moses put in something nice for them, but God didn't say anything about them. <laughs> maybe. Yeah, it's... It, there's it's kind of like a how a mom kind of softens the blow when dad lay, you know, laid out the judgment. But remember that historically speaking, both Reuven and Yehuda did bad things. Yeah, yeah. Like really, really bad things. Simeon, so, but yeah, but he's not listed. And this is... Simeon is not listed here. It's another, that's another side of it. But Levi is... And you know, in the blessing of Jacob, Levi and Simeon, uh, or Levi and Shimon, are mentioned together but Levi as, as received, one group. But, but Levi was kind of redeemed after the issue with the golden calf. Yeah. Whereas Reuben yeah. and Simeon were not. So it, it seems like that's the only reason. But you're right. It, 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 Simeon not being here is definitely odd. Mm-hmm. Then you have, for example, you know, God. There's a lot of description here. Um, uh, you know. God is described as a lion or a lioness. Dan is described as a lion. Um, you know, Asher, yeah, actually, actually, it says here that Asher dips his feet in oil. Actually, the story of a guy who wanted to look for oil in the area of the tribe of Asher, where he misunderstood that Shemin is not oil in the same sense. This is actually olive oil. In the area of Asher, by the way, which is an area I used to go to school to, there are, um, uh, there are a lot of olive trees. Mm. Pretty cool ones as well. Actually, I made olive oil from those trees once. It was a kind of thing we had to do with school. Um, you know, and there are a lot of interesting terms here towards them. I'm really kind of cutting through it um, because we don't, we don't have enough time to go over everything. And, I, and um, But the thing here at the end is that you know, there's interesting descriptions here. Like, for example, Me'ona Elohe Kedem. This is in verse 27. You know, what is this Me'ona Elohe Kedem? What well, is this well, Me'ona Elohe just, just, just so we can do this, right, if you don't mind. Let's start over at 20, mm-hmm. 26, because it seems like at 25, that ends the blessing for the tribes. Now it's Israel as a nation and God directly. Well, it's, it's, actually, it's more of a praise to God. Ah, okay. From Israel. I, I, because you referred to Yeshurun, that's why I was wondering. Yeah, I, I think it's I think it's a praise to God with a certain level of perspective of the, from the perspective of the people of Israel. Mm-hmm. But there's no there's no one like the God of Yeshurun, and and the writer of heavens is your is in your aid and, and um, that's an interesting term. There is none like God, O Yeshurun, yeah, writing through the heavens to your help in His Majesty in the skies. So that's an It's uh, Oh, and with his majesty, he rides in the Shachim. So Shachak is a parallel of Shamaim. Okay, now it makes sense. Um, you know, so this is kind of like a like they're saying God is the um, you know, writer of heavens. He's so glorious. You know, but Meona Elohe Kedem is an interesting term. Um, so his, uh, you know, his his maybe his place of dwelling. Well, let me uh, read he's it. in the let heavens. Me let me read yeah. English for you. A shelter is the ancient God beneath the arms of the ageless one. He drove out from before you the enemy, saying, destroy. So, I'm not too sure if that will be the correct translation. Okay. Maybe Me'ona refers back to the heavens. So, his dwelling is in the heavens, but in the earth, his... his, his um, yeah, or beneath hmm. his arms, or beneath his wings. Olam, Olam might be a reference to God, So, in, and beneath the, the arms of Olam... The arms of God are in the in the earth. I mean, he dwells in the heavens. He's the right of the heavens. But his arms, his actions, his ability, his deeds are in the land. And his protection, yeah, his, yeah, 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 sure. Absolutely. And he and he he, 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 he and he you know scatters your enemies. And it says, "And Israel dwells with peace." You know, in verse twenty-eight. Mm-hmm. You know, by itself, Ein Yaakov. Uh, Ein Yaakov actually might be the. Uh, uh, Ein might actually be here a fountain, okay. not the eye of yeah, Jacob, have, but the fountain uh, of Jacob. Fountain. Yeah. Yeah, like, and like a, a water eye. They have they they call yeah. that that's what they call a spring down here, a water eye. Yeah, so we call it an ein, which is basically a water eye as well. Um, you know, to a land of of dagan and tirosh. So dagan is a uh, another word for for grains. Uh, not dagon. Don't though, though. By the way, the name dagon is related to some degree yeah. to the issue of, of of grains, but we just use the word dagan and tirosh, which is um, grapes. 
new wine. Okay. Maybe. You know, new wine as well. Basically, it's a, it's a phrase. You know, Israel, you're 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 the people of God. You're so you're so blessed to be to be mm-hmm. under His protection. Amen. Amen. And that, yeah. And then and then they are just going back at the end here to the issue of uh, you know Moses being buried and his p- place of burial never never known. Moses it seems to be if we look at the finale here, that Moses says the blessing, takes his whatever he needs with him, and just walks away and vanishes. But it seems to be the text knows where he went to to die, but it doesn't want to reveal it to us. Maybe someone knew exactly where he died. Sure. Well, it's assumed that Joshua finished out the book, right? It it, it could be also that you know, um, you know, he actually. It's it's another question by itself. I mean, it's 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 an assumption. The Talmud has a discussion about, you know, how exactly was the book finished. Uh, some people, some one of the opinions is that Mo, that Joshua finished the book, and there's the opinion that says that Moses was writing this while he was crying. Uh, but the, at the end of the day, it seems to be that it's very very clear that someone added this, especially that it moves to the third person description, and. But it says here, it's very interesting, verse 6 says, Vaikbo oto vagai. Vaikbo means that someone did something. Now, it doesn't say vayikavel, someone buried him. Vaikbo, vaikbo, which is a third person, a third, third person masculine singular, uh, inverted verb, which can maintains the same subject, which means to be the Lord. So it seems to be as, as if God was the one who buried him. He had a miraculous burial. So it seems to be that they knew where he went to to die. But the exact burial site was unknown. So the last one of the last places that they knew Moses stood was Mount Nebo or Mount Har Nebo, and that's why they erected a temple there. Mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. to prevent it from being a temple to celebrate Moses, it was a tele- temple of the Lord with vestments and tools and instruments and everything. But it was a temple to God. But it was considered to be a holy site because this is the last known place that God spoke directly to Moses. So that might have been very, very important to people. That temple was sacked mm. by by Misha, king of Moab. I remember reading the and Misha it, steel, or Misha stone. Yeah, and uh, we actually, I actually had to write a um, something based on the Misha steel. It's uh, it was an interesting exercise, uh, but you know, it's a, it's also a very interesting thing because it's written very similar. The language is very, very close to Hebrew. Basically, Moabite is a dialect of Canaanite, or I can say, oh, they're all Canaanite. They're just different offshots of Canaanite. So Hebrew is a type of Canaanite. Sure. Canaanite is a type of Canaanite. Moabite is a type of, of Canaanite as well. Ugaritic is also a type of Canaanite because they all share. They're basically all built more or less the same. But then, you know, it's kind of interesting, this, this, this last description. It's very rare that Tanakh describes someone physically. And here it describes that, you know, he he, he stayed focused and healthy yep, his until eye the had last not day. Dim. His vigor had not fled. Which is very unusual, but basically it shows that God was with him to give him the strength to carry on with all the work he had to do. So basically, it's it's the idea of the next leader. God is going to be the next leader and give him the power to do what he has to do. But, you know, it's dependent. Are you going to follow God or not? Yeah. If you're going to follow God, he'll give you the strength. If you're not, and you think it's all about you, it's not going to happen. Kind of like closing the circle we started with. You know, it, it, you mentioned that, and I, I kind of think of Solomon, the guy with all the wisdom in the world, everything you could ask for wisdom-wise, but, you know, he started following his own wisdom, and the blessings ended. Mm-hmm. Same idea. Mm-hmm. Uh, I really like that. Yeah. So, uh, Yoel, you know, this is the end of, of the cycle for the year. The, the, the Torah portion... It, it seldom gets read because uh, most people are so busy with Sukkot that they never even hear this. Uh, the end of Deuteronomy, the the literally the the final um, I want to say the final presentation of Moses to his people. The whole book of Deuteronomy, I think, is the most important book in the entire scriptures. Um, and here we are, we're finishing it up today. Is there anything that you'd like to say uh, to the people uh, about? their need to understand the message, the, the, the underlying message, the recurring message throughout Deuteronomy. Is there anything you want to say to them? The only thing I say is keep on reading. Read, 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 and read. And every time you read, you're going to discover more information, more points, Amen. Amen. more ideas. The, 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 the general idea here is keep the covenant, keep the covenant, keep the covenant. Amen. 
There are a lot of subtleties, a lot of different points that you can see. This is why we repeatedly read these things over and over again in a cycle. Well, and then I'd like to finalize it by saying, just like that, keep the covenant, keep the covenant. But what is what is a recurring theme throughout each of these presentations, final presentations of, of these mighty men, uh, David uh, included, uh, Samuel included, uh, you know, that there's a re- reference over and over again to keeping the covenant and not going into idolatry, not listening to the voice of another who will tell you to disobey and turn your back to God. Uh, if you find yourself in that place, in this place that is... I call the unpardonable sin. Uh, repent. Turn away from it. Turn your back to those things that are telling you to turn your uh, back to God and turn your face to God. And never turn around from God. Always keep your face towards God. Do not listen to anyone who tells you to turn and walk uh, away from God or to not obey God. That is seems to be the message over and over again. Yep. So, Yoel, uh, thank you again. Uh, shalom aleichem, everybody. We'll talk to you again soon.